All right. Okay. The next panel is about um, how to spot a unicorn scaling up the startups. Uh, we really live here in the hotbed of startups, and one of our star faculty, Toby Stewart, faculty director, Berkeley House Entrepreneurship, is going to chair this event. And our panelists are Anil Kamath, fellow and vice president of technology at Adobe, and Ajit Singh, co founder and executive chairman of ThoughtSpot, and Venkatesh Shukla, general partner. Montana Vista Capital and ex-chair of uh, Thai Global and B.B. Jagdish, managing partner of Kaj Ventures. And uh, take it away, Toby. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's, it's terrific to be here. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, and let me thank our panelists for coming. We have a remarkably distinguished panel with a very diverse set of backgrounds. Uh, and we plan a conversation around the state of the private markets at the moment uh, across the United States and India, as well as um, a conversation about how to build a great company. So those are broad topics, uh, but we'll try to make some headway in them. There'll be plenty of time for Q&A, so um, if you want to start thinking about that. Um, I'll give it uh, just a 15-second introduction and then, and then start by asking our panelists each to do that so you have a better sense of um, who's up here this afternoon, and maybe that'll help frame some questions. So my name's Toby Stewart. I'm the faculty director of the Entrepreneurship Center here at Berkeley Haas. Um, I'm also the faculty director of what we call the Institute for Business Innovation. Uh, much of my research career has looked at entrepreneurship in the tech sector, uh, and I kick around it in this valley in, in many different capacities. So, um, so that's how I managed to get up here today. BB, if we could, if we could maybe start with you. Yeah. Good afternoon. You're all awake. <laughs> the tea hasn't arrived yet. The pakoda hasn't arrived yet. I just went to see if the tea has arrived. Um, I guess all of you have to wait until this panel gets over. So thank you so much for putting together this wonderful panel and the wonderful event today. It's been a terrific uh, learning for us as well. So my name is Bibi Jagadish and I've been in this country for the last 36 years. And uh, my entrepreneurial journey started back in 1993 when myself and a partner of mine, KB Chandrasekhar, started our first company called Exodus Communications, which pioneered the concept of uh, internet data centers. First Indian unicorn. First Indian unicorn, yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, took the company public in uh, 1998, and uh, we, we had a market cap of uh, 25, 27 billion dollars at its peak. And given the importance of the company, we were actually considered as a national asset by the White House back in uh, 99, 2000 because of the kind of customers that we had across all our data centers. And then I started my next company called NetScaler, which was to solve some scaling problems that we were facing at internet. We created a technology that helped to uh, scale the internet, a company called Netscaler, and we went through, as you all know, there was a lot of ups and downs uh, after the dot-com burst, and uh, so we did well after going through some downturns. We made uh, appropriate changes, and, and in uh, 2005, the company was very successfully sold to Citrix, and I was with Citrix for a bunch of years, and then since then, I've been focusing primarily in investing in early stage startup companies. And during this course of time, given the fact that I also have lots of interest in India, uh, I embarked on uh, two different paths. One was to fund some exciting companies, especially given all the talks that is going on today about the digitization aspect of it. So I funded a company called NetMagic, which was once again to bring the internet to corporations. So NetMagic was, was the very early pioneer of uh, internet data centers in India, which is sort of like what we did at Exodus, but we did that in India, but lots of challenges in India, but we managed to overcome that. And I also funded another company 
called Eduride, which uh, actually brought uh, education software and it, it actually became like a de facto standard between K1 and 12. Uh, uh, and a lot of these classrooms became these smart classrooms. And for a smart classroom, this Eduride technology, which brings uh, education to be taught at a very simplistic level to the K1 to 12. So that company also was acquired by Pearson's and Pearson's managed to actually scale Eduride to the masses uh, much later. And today I focus primarily in uh, angel investments and 60% uh, of my time I, I spend on capitalistic opportunities and 40% of my time I spend on socialistic, uh, social impact kind of opportunities. So I work uh, in uh, many nonprofit areas focusing on education, healthcare, and water related activities. And as Mohan was asking me in the morning that I should bring the technology to India, I did. Whatever I could, I, I actually did. <laughs> and in fact, uh, to, to uh, Punita Reddy, who, talk, who talked about uh, uh, tele, telemedicine, in fact, we funded a company back in 1999 2000, a company called Televital, which is very widely used today in India to bring telemedicine to the rural by connecting lots of super specialty hospitals, especially the government hospitals. So this is very widely used with the partnership of ISRO, given the fact that India did not have good communications. We used uh, ISRO's satellite connectivity to connect uh, thousands of villages into super specialty hospitals across the whole nation. And this technology was very widely, has been very widely used. And I'm, I'm actually very proud to say that, you know, the, the usage of this is increasing every day and uh, lots of lives have been saved using this whole telemedicine technology, you know, bringing this uh, digitization concept. So life is pretty exciting and lots of uh, challenges. Uh, India is not as smooth as we all think, but uh, we cannot stop just because it's not smooth. So we continue to do our work, continue to bring both uh, entrepreneurship because that's very important to create the jobs and uh, social impact because that's very important to help eliminate the poverty. And that's the charter in which I'm working now. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> following B.V. Jagdish is always a hard challenge uh, and plus my resume is not as impressive as his so I'll keep it brief. Uh, I used to be a serial entrepreneur in Silicon Valley and I had some successes and some what we call in Silicon Valley valuable learning experiences. <laughs> and after the last one I did as a CEO was that so, uh, so then I said okay I'm not going to do anything I'll uh, 18 months I'll just sit home and, and meditate. I got, <laughs> I got bored very quickly so I started this uh, angel investor group called Thai Angels which did very well. I liked it so much that I you know started doing uh, started my own venture fund called Monta Vista Capital and along the way uh, I think the most memorable thing I did uh, two things actually one is uh, uh, to become president of Thai and we invited uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi to come here and, uh, and and we were able to you know engage him enough that uh, he got us involved in drafting the startup India policy and uh, that's a uh, that's very satisfying of, uh, you know, an interaction with the government where they actually listened to you and actually implemented some of your ideas. So that was very satisfying. Along the way, I think uh, BV and I launched a program about four years ago in India called Billion Dollar Babies. And the whole idea was to pick three or four startups from India every year, uh, the most promising startups, and expose them to our networks in Silicon Valley and beyond and to accelerate their success into billion dollar valuation. Uh, so that thing you see has, you know, has evolved. Uh, 
it's become Startup Bridge India now, where we in, now we get 25 startups from India every year, and uh, introduce them to big companies uh, in US. So that has been a very very satisfying part. The other connection to India has been that uh, I've been uh, uh, you know I've been involved. Uh, with a non-profit called Foundation for Excellence. We give scholarships to extremely talented kids in India who are extremely poor, kids of maid servants, street, uh, street vendors, and things like that. 18,000 of them so far we have funded who are talented enough to get into an IIT, NIT, or a middle college or something like that. I was very, uh, you know, I was very uh, happy to meet uh, one of those students here who is doing PhD in uh, electrical engineering here, one of those kids. Uh, is he here still? No, he's, off. he's off. Okay. Okay. He went back. Okay. He, he went back to write his paper. Okay. Uh, and uh, you know, a lot of people here are supporters of that. And uh, in, in fact, Mohan Das Pai, he he spots a good idea and he supports it. So he's one of those ideas that he has supported. So you know, we have a lot of passion. You see about uh, about this cross-border entrepreneurship and some ideas is here and and what's holding back more. All right. Thank you, Ajit. Okay. Is it working? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Ajit Singh. I'm a co-founder and exec chairman at uh, ThoughtSpot. Um, I'm pretty confident that this is probably going to be the most uh, disappointing session of the whole day. <laughs> <laughs> because the topic is how to spot a unicorn. So if you came here thinking that you learned some magic formula yeah. and then go invest in companies that become unicorns, that's not going to happen. So uh, apologies for disappointment. Um, uh, so my background, first 10 years of uh, my life, I worked in large companies uh, in India actually till 2006 and uh, I came to the valley in 2007 to work for Oracle. Um, I could uh, do that only for 9 months because when I worked in large companies, I was most interested in building new things, uh, new products and uh, when I came to the valley, I was like I couldn't uh, be in the valley and uh, not do startups. So I joined a company called Astro Data Systems where I ran product management. Uh, from there, with two other uh, 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 partners from Astro Data, uh, started a company called Nutanix, which has done pretty well. I was a co-founder and chief products officer there. In 2012, I started ThoughtSpot, my second company, uh, which is also a unicorn. So I've been extremely, extremely fortunate to have co-founded uh, two unicorns. And I can tell you that there is no, uh, there is no way to spot one early. If you went to our first office in, uh, in uh, Nutanix, Actually, many candidates used to come and uh, then they would never respond to our emails. It was so bad. Uh, so we started doing interviews in Starbucks. We would not even invite them to our office uh, uh, for interviews. So there is, there is no, absolutely no secret formula. Maybe one of the best way to spot a unicorn is to clone you. <laughs> <laughs> That's also not going to work. In fact, another uh, interesting trivia. So um, uh, our second office was slightly better. And I believe that was an office where uh, That's Exodus where I met. was. Uh, That's where I met you guys. And it had some relationship with Exodus also was, yes, uh, was yes, there. Yes. It was a, a small suite in Santa Clara for about 25 people. Yeah, yeah. They, the, Nutanix, when I got involved with Nutanix back in uh, 20, 2011, I think, that is when you guys were in this uh, Santa Clara Mission Center. Yeah. And they happened to be in the same suite where Exodus was. Yeah. And then when I told the CEO, he went and announced to the whole company. And so if you guys, if any of you want, what is the sweet number, come and talk to me. <laughs> it's, it's two and five. <laughs> right, and Neil? Yeah, I think speaking of offices, even the office which I had for my startup was so bad that uh, there used to be two dogs who used to scare away everybody who came and uh, it was all uh, uh, terribly carpeted. So we would also take people out to Starbucks to interview. Uh, but yeah, I came here uh, into Silicon Valley uh, 27 years ago to do my PhD at Stanford and Silicon Valley has changed, but so has India over the last 27 years, it has really transformed itself. Um, I um, been been doing startups for most of my career since I finished my PhD. My first one was during the dot-com boom in the e-commerce comparison shopping space. Uh, we um, uh, we went through the whole boom and bust cycle and uh, eventually we were acquired uh, 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 which uh, happened after the after the bus so having gone through the bus we learned a lot of good lessons uh, coming out of it uh, and uh, we uh, after that i started my second company which uh, was in the ad tech space we grew it to um, 
manage about two billion dollars of ad spend uh, and were acquired by Adobe and I've been with Adobe since then for the last six years. So from my experience uh, uh, at Adobe, I'm seeing a lot of the unicorns uh, coming to us uh, as well and the valuations that we see for companies that we acquire has steadily gone up over the last uh, five or six years that we have been now making acquisitions in, in, in this space. Uh, I'm also involved with uh, uh, Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs, which is an uh, um, uh, alumni association of Stanford that invests in young startups. And in the course of that, I've invested in a couple of companies, one uh, in the India context, one of them with Bank, which uh, provides content over WhatsApp to uh, Indian people for whom internet is the WhatsApp in many cases. Is an antidote to fake news. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the other startup uh, was more of a uh, company which started in India but moved to the US to sell to US companies, which is, I guess, a new trend that we are seeing uh, called Hypertrack. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting uh, thing which I'm seeing with Indian companies. They are not limiting themselves to the Indian marketplace, but seeing the worldwide market as an opportunity to grow. So, um, with that. Uh, so, thank you for the introductions, and, um, and you can all see what a remarkable panel we have. I, I sort of thought we had it split up between the investors and the entrepreneurs, but it turns out the, the entrepreneurs were, the investors were entrepreneurs before they became investors. That's so, a good sign. Yeah, so we have a, um, but we have a, a rich array of experience here. Um, Ajit's already ruled out half the panel, which was going to be about how you spot a unicorn um, um, as being a unicorn-like task that will not, we will not succeed at. Um, the second half of our mandate, which maybe we'll spend a minute on, uh, to get started is the state of the markets and maybe like the other panels that have happened we will dance across continents because um, because markets aren't necessarily globally correlated and let me start off with a, um, with a, a position on that and then ask the panel to react to it so I think I recently somebody sent me an article it was a link to an, F, an SF gate article and and if I read it correctly median house prices in San Francisco in the first half of 2018 accelerated in percentage and absolute terms more than any other ever historic measured change in the heat of a housing market, um, which I took to be a sign of the time. So let me start off with a blanket um, assertion, which is the, the private tech markets on the investor side have never been more expensive than they are right now. Can I take that? Yes, please. So I've been, you know, I've been investing in early stage, real early stage for the last 10 years now actively. I see absolutely no inflation at early stage. I've been investing, you see, at companies which I valued less than 8 million in 2010, and I continue to invest in companies that I valued less than, less than 10. All the inflation that is taking place is, uh, you know, at Series B and beyond, sometimes Series A also. So that's when the risk is taken out, the product market fit is there, the critical mass is there, and that's when you see, you know, the, the Goldman Sachs and SoftBanks and, and Morgan Stanley's and Fidelities are willing to put a huge amount of money, which is raising this thing sky high. But at an early stage, you know, that's where there is absolutely no change in valuation uh, from 10 years ago. Huh. But, uh, you know, it depends on the pedigree, it depends on the credentials of the entrepreneurs, because I, I've actually seen uh, some of the VCs who never gave more than a $10 million pre-money. I've actually seen these people giving more than 25 to $30 million pre-money because they don't want to lose out on good opportunities, right? Again, spotting a unicorn. So if you look at the pedigree of some of these entrepreneurs, the background and what they have done and so on and so forth, the last thing you want to do is to lose out because ultimately if you actually do the math, if, if that entrepreneur truly builds a billion dollar value, then what you're giving up in the early stages is actually not much. You can still make a big cut out of it. I should have made the blanket statement. 
I have made some exceptions. Yes. <laughs> and, and one of them is sitting here in the audience. <laughs> yes, yeah. I, I'll give you uh, an entrepreneur's uh, view on this because um, I'm not uh, still um, a bona fide investor, unlike uh, my fellow panelists. Uh, so I, I look at uh, valuations as, uh, as uh, something that is relevant point in time, but when you're building a company, unless you are starting with the mentality of, I'm going to build it and sell it, and there is a finite uh, time of uh, window, window of time that you need to do that in. If you take a 10 year view of a startup, uh, you are going to go through some macro cycles. You will raise certain um, uh, rounds on high, higher than um, right valuations and assuming there is such a thing as a right valuation and uh, you will raise certain rounds at uh, lower valuation. So at, um, at ThoughtSpot we did our Series C um, in uh, March of 2016 and my the, the day I started uh, fundraising was the day when Tableau and uh, LinkedIn were cut in half and we play in Tableau space. Um, and it was, I, we still managed to raise a good, great round. It was probably 20, 30% lower than what we would have gotten uh, in an up market, but uh, who cares? You know, if you're building something for the long term, it doesn't really matter. Um, are the markets uh, heated up right now? Uh, definitely, there is, um, uh, both private and public markets are up. And uh, I look at this as uh, there is the intrinsic value of a startup and there is also demand supply. So there is definitely a lot more demand uh, for investing in tech companies in particular because uh, the world is digitizing and uh, the if you looked at the whole world as a portfolio, that portfolio is shifting from traditional uh, investments like cement factories and manufacturing to, to more uh, towards technology. So that demand and supply is creating um, uh, higher valuations, uh, but as an entrepreneur, I also know that when you're looking to hire engineers, they're also 20, 30, 40% higher than what I saw when I did my first company, Nutanix. We started in 2009. That was on the back of uh, you know the worst uh, economic cycle that we had seen in a long time. And ability to attract talent and what you had to pay uh, for talent was very different than what we have to do now. We are competing with uh, uh, people that can walk into uh, Facebook and Google five to six years of experience out of uh, a great college and they can get half a million dollars. Uh, you, you couldn't package. convince so, them to take ThoughtSpot stocks? No, no, we do. That's why we are building the company. We are. But I'm saying that uh, uh, raising money, it might seem that it is easier, but everything after that is harder. You're competing for uh, more talent, you're paying more, uh, office rents are higher, uh, everything is higher after that. So end of the day, these things normalize out and uh, as an entrepreneur, I don't really care of the valuation that you might uh, hit in a certain uh, round. Yeah, I guess everything is relative. Um, I mean, the, during the dot-com boom, the it was very easy to raise money and the valuations were much higher. And then we had sort of the whole boom bust cycle uh, and now I think uh, there is there is a Series A crunch. You have a lot of money going into seed stage companies where it's easy to raise money at somewhat decent valuations. But uh, there are so many such seed funded companies now available for the Series A venture capitalists that uh, uh, they tend to pick the best of the lot. And they are, of course, willing to pay a lot more at that time. But they get to pick from pretty mature seed stage companies and the best seed stage companies that are out there available. Um, and I agree with uh, uh, what Ajit said as well, which is there is, uh, in some sense, it's easy to start a company with easy cloud computing and uh, uh, capital access being easier. But getting talent is very, very expensive. I mean, you're competing with the Facebooks and the Googles of the world, especially in Silicon Valley. And to get good talent, you have to pay top dollars. So that's become the bigger crunch point in terms of uh, starting a new new good company. Okay, so let me let me quickly comment and then and then maybe we'll shift gears a little bit. So I, I can remember so it's funny you say you, you pay eight or ten on, on the seed stage. So the first class I ever taught after moving to Berkeley, and this was maybe eight years ago, I, I invited one of the legendary seed investors in the valley and to speak to my students. And I can remember he addressed my class, opening it up by saying 2.5 is the new two. And we all looked at him like, well, you know, what the hell does that, that, that must be why, there must be wisdom in this. And he then went on to say that had I have come here six months ago, um, all the deals I was, I was doing, I was doing it too. 
and now all the deals I'm doing, I'm doing at 2.5. So this is one of the $50,000, $100,000 checks. But remember the days uh, just a few years ago when the seed deals were actually much, much, much less expensive than they are now. But if we go off of what um, BV alluded to and in 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 Ajit said, um, so the cost of labor is increased by 30%. By my reckoning, the cost of space is increased by even more than 30%. I mean, that seems to be the annual increase um, in the cost of space. There's 0% unemployment um, in the sectors in which we're recruiting into these organizations. The salaries that um, the kids are getting when they graduate from, even, even the summer salaries are insanity compared to what um, I think we used to wor work for. So now it might be our kids who are looking at those kinds of numbers, but it's kind of nutty what Ajit is probably paying a, sub a summer intern or Anil is paying a summer intern right now. Um, um, so two questions for the panel. One is, um, when's it going to end anytime soon? And the second is, how does it compare to the market and the opportunity space in India? You mean the valuations? Yeah, uh, the, the, I mean, if you uh, could, if you could deploy, sadly, sadly. if you were, if you were thinking simply about the return on your investable capital in the start in the startup sector, and you could deploy it at will across the two geographies, um, which of them is more overheated? Which of them has you know better sort of near term, as in the investment cycle of? of of startup capital, which of them has better near-term returns? Which market are you more bullish on in the next in the in the future that you can foresee? I, I think uh, two points I want to make. One is uh, some of us have seen this kind of a hype back in the dot-com boom days. Exactly same kind of scenario, right? Difficult to hire the talent. Uh, valuations are high. Lots of money floating around. And the correction that essentially happened was the stock market crash, the dot-com market crash, now all of that, they kind of brought the whole market back to the ground level. And everything actually came down. And, and during the process, a lot of seed investors, angel investors, in fact, in fact, there was a joke at that time, all the angels went to heaven. <laughs> right? So, uh, uh, all the angel investors vanished, the seed investors vanished, and uh, uh, many of the venture capitalists, actually, I don't have the exact number, but lots of them who were founded during that 98, 99 time frame, lots of them went out of business, right? Because they could not come back and raise their next round of funding. So, is the scenario the same today? I Probably not, because I think it seems like it's a lot more real today with real revenues and real re growth, real customers. So the activities is a is, is lot more real compared to the 2000. But having said that, you know, we are matured enough to, to see that, at least I've seen since 1982, four or five cycles of ups and downs. And I, I think it's almost imminent in the next six months to one year, some sort of a correction to happen. Okay, Anil. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, the boom boom bust cycle is sort of a given, I guess, in in the space that we are in, and I think we are seeing right now probably somewhere close to the peak in terms of where we are with respect to both the money going into uh, startups as well as in terms of the cost of hiring talent. Um, there's also the other side. I think the markets are. Uh, I mean, the markets are, are, are what they are, right? I think you are seeing a lot more talent, for example, coming into, uh, pe more people are taking computer science, both here in the US as well as in India. So you're seeing more people graduating with degrees uh, in the field that there is a talent shortage. Data science, you are seeing more universities are opening up machine learning and AI relate related courses. So you'll see more talent coming in that space as well. So I think it's just a matter of time that I feel that the the forces that are at play will adjust themselves, and you'll see some normalization. So I'm, I I mean I think uh, these cycles are uh, natural in terms of the industry that we are playing in, and I wouldn't read too much into it. 
wait, let me let me become the optimist for a moment, and and then ask you a different question, which maybe I will put to Ajit, which is. Um, there's one thing we do understand, which is that if there's any truth whatsoever to how we think about valuation, um, valuations in high growth companies, um, uh, that is tech companies, are very interest rate sensitive. When interest rates go up, near term profits are much more valuable than long term profits, profits that are far down the road in any kind of valuation model. So we do understand that. Um, absent massive hike in, in interest rates, um, let me be an optimist and say, well, what has changed is this is nothing like to the year 2000 and the year 1999 because almost all of the unicorn equivalents at that time were e-commerce companies. And if we think about what's going on right now, um, we have vehicular autonomy, we have everything around artificial intelligence, we have fintech and crypto, um, we have the cloud, we have SaaS, we have fundamental transfer t transformations in the life sciences and the convergence of data in the life sciences. Um, we have amazing AI companies that are, that are looking at and analyzing data in ways with insights um, uh, in ways that are so profoundly different than anything we've seen in the past. We have robotics, we have the Internet of Things, we have sensors everywhere. We have um, everything happening on 37 different pillars, depending on how you count versus one. Um, so Ajit, as you think about your company now, um, and you've been involved in, in highly valued companies in the past, all of you have, um, is, the value, is the valuation justified and is it fundamental? Yeah, so let me just uh, think for a second. So uh, the question we are asking is, uh, are the valuations we are seeing right now are justified? And it's very hard to answer that question with a very broad uh, brush. I would say that in general, uh, maybe uh, the market is 20% higher than what it would be if the overall thing was more sane. Uh, but uh, what is uh, important is uh, uh, there is a lot of variation when you look at uh, individual companies. Um, and uh, I think uh, there is, as you said, there is a lot more um, real problems the people are trying to solve. And the means to solve those problems have become more powerful. So we are all building tools, but the tools we use to build these tools are, are a lot more powerful. So. Um, I do think that uh, the value creation that is happening right now and the, and the range of uh, uh, areas in which innovation is happening, it's much, much broader than uh, the year 2000. I used to be at I2 Technologies at the time. I was a kid out of school at the time. And the company was uh, at some point worth 40 to $50 billion. And next day it was, it was trading on pink sheets. You know, it couldn't even uh, stay on the stock market. Um, so I, I do think that... Um, uh, the innovation happening today is a lot more uh, real um, and uh, valuations are they justified I think by and large uh, they are they are still okay uh, they are not uh, crazy and if you look at the number of IPOs that have happened uh, in the last uh, three years it's not a very huge amount so there is uh, given the amount of innovation that has happened given the number of sectors in which things are going on uh, there is a lot of bulking up in the in the private uh, markets that's going on, and uh, I do think that uh, there is real stuff out there. So, Neil, maybe if you could jump in now. You've looked at this. If if you put your hat on as the CTO of Adobe, you've looked at. You guys have been fairly active in the acquisition markets um, for early stage companies, and and I'm sure you look at a tremendous amount more than than actually hits the the deal log. So, as as you've been looking at deals. Do you find sort of the ratio of price to fundamental value to be there, or does it all look just overinflated to you? I think in the private markets, we are seeing much higher expectations of valuations than in the publicly traded companies, for sure. Um, I think there is definitely a, a higher... Um, valuations that people are associating with uh, private companies who are playing in a space where um, they think there is big potential for growth, right? I think that, that I think, is uh, uh, something which maybe the VCs have learned over several years to um, not underestimate the potential of certain technologies uh, 
transforming uh, industries and transforming the, uh, the, the, the whole power law where you can have companies uh, start small and not have much revenue, but through sheer the, the power law grow into behemoths that you will have to later on take on and compete. I think that, that realization is definitely very strong in the venture capital world. But then companies like Adobe acquire, uh, I mean, we have to tie it to our fundamentals and we have to tie it to uh, actual revenue uh, multiples that we can uh, justify in the context of the acquisition. So, and the revenue multiples have gone up. Even for Adobe itself, its uh, stock price is now at a much higher multiple to its sales than it was five years ago, six years ago. So in that sense, I think there is willingness to pay that higher multiple, but it has to be still in the context of what we can afford. So, you know, uh, at a macro level, if you look at all the success of technology so far, uh, has been in data intensive industries, which is, uh, you know, uh, media, which is e-commerce, those kind of things. The real hard physical industries are only now beginning to be touched by technology. So this is like automobile, this is like construction, uh, shipping. Those are the things which are bulk of the economy. Now they are getting, uh, now that the sensors and therefore software and therefore management is only now getting into it. So vast new areas you see of economy are now opening up to technology. And I think that kind of optimism is reflected, you see, in you know, in higher PE ratios you see for, uh, for successful technology companies. Okay, so I'm gonna just take a, and I'm sorry for the scattered conversation, I'm gonna ask you each a specific question, um, the whole panel, and then let's start to open it up to some questions from the audience. So the specific question I'm gonna ask you too, and just a, a real quick, what's your view and what's your color? I'm gonna give you $200 million to invest in the early stage, that's seed in A, are you going to deploy the capital in Silicon Valley or in India, and why? And then I'm going to give you $5 billion to deploy at the later stage, um, which is confusing these days because, you know, we've looked at, at Bs that are, that are multi-billion dollar valuations, but let's call that the E, F, and G round. Are you going to deploy the capital in Silicon Valley or India and why? Um, so not long answers because I want to leave some time for the audience. I'm sure they have a lot of questions for you. But, but uh, uh, BV, start, start with you. Early stage capital, India or Silicon Valley? Uh, that's a very, very good question. <laughs> so given, given the, the type of companies that I'm interested in, in investing, mainly because I, I always invest in companies where I can add value, which is primarily centered around enterprise companies versus consumer companies. Uh, I, this is my personal experience of investing in India. Uh, the markets for the Indian enterprise companies is still not there to the extent that I would like to see because I think the uh, customers are especially you know the early stage customers that you want to see are not there yet to adapt to these enterprise so which means I, I have to build a company in India and very quickly I have to figure out how to move those companies to global markets which basically means I have to bring them here so given that I, I would actually put 80% of my money in Silicon Valley and 20% of that in India. Okay. You know, I think uh, I couldn't articulate it better than him. Uh, I'm also a B2B investor, not a B2C investor. Uh, and, you know, the, the ecosystem, especially the ecosystem of customers and partners that exist here, uh, doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. So... Uh, so my this thing would be, you know, right now it would be 100 percent here. But if you give me growth capital, I'll invest most of it in India. <laughs> okay, so your answer is seed here and seed gro here. And, and and growth in India, and that's just because you're much more optimistic about the the near term growth rate of the Indian markets. Because I, early stage requires a lot of hand holding of entrepreneurs and adding value to them, and that's my skill set. 
I can't do that remotely. He's sitting here, is he to help Indian entrepreneurs? Uh, but, you know, late stage investing is about numbers and macro factors. And th those look great for India. Yeah, I'm not uh, an expert investor, so I'll uh, uh, probably not feel comfortable taking so much money from you to invest. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I'd say, you know, wherever I find uh, great people, I'll invest. Um, early stage investing is, is uh, you can have all the theories, but ultimately it does come down to betting on people. There's nothing else to go by um, because ideas change, markets in which they operate change, all of those things change. And uh, if, you, if you have, so it depends on where you have a strong network. If you have a strong network and you have access to the greatest talent here, I would invest it here. If you have access to great talent in India, I would invest there. Uh, when it comes to late stage investing, again, not an expert, but I was... Uh, as we can see, nine of the world's uh, top 20 tech companies are Chinese companies. And I don't think we would have predicted that just even seven, eight years ago. There is so much that has gone on. So um, uh, if, the, if the infrastructure in India, I think there is a little bit more maturity that needs to occur there. But at some point, we'll be really ready for uh, growth stage investing in a massive way. Um, yeah, I think I agree with what Wing said. Actually, I mean, I... I'm a technologist, so I like uh, to invest in innovation and technology. So I, early stage, my preference is definitely for working with companies in Silicon Valley who uh, are on the cutting edge of technology, doing things which are um, uh, sort of in a market that is not yet defined and very innovative in terms of what, what they're bringing uh, to market, right? Uh, but I agree that in the later stage, there is a big opportunity in India where if there is a product market fit which has been proven in US or in China, you just have to throw a lot of money at it in India and make it work at scale. You get the benefits uh, of being the first first there. You get the benefits of uh, uh, scaling it to a very large, large market very quickly um, and all the network effects and monopolies that result as a result of that. So later stage, it makes sense to invest bigger in companies which have already shown that ambition and that drive to make it successful in that market. Okay, thank you very much. Let, let me, uh, before we move to refreshments, uh, open up the, the floor to you for any questions you have for the panelists. Front row, please. Um, so my question is to Wengtesh uh, about Startup India policy. Um, is there anything in that policy that you would change looking back? Absolutely. And I fought hard on that. One of the things that they have included is income tax exemption to start up for the first three years, which is a completely brain dead approach. It's being changed. Uh, it's being changed. It's being changed. Well, yeah. Uh, Angel investing was another one. So both Mohan Isi and I fought on this as we met the prime minister and finally. Uh, finally, something has happened there, not 100%, but they have made some progress. So the problem is that, uh, you know, that uh, even if there is a political will at a higher level, by the time the bureaucracy gets involved, they really have no skin in the game. They've never created a single job in their life. They don't know how a business operates. And they are the ones that you would devise all the rules. And so it's like, you, you think, you see, you have, uh, that you have won, that political leadership is convinced. And then the regulations come, and then the fight starts all over again. Uh, luckily, this thing is, you know, moving in the right direction. Yeah, one question I want to ask, you know, related to the same thing is, for individual investors, the tax that you are imposed on your capital gains, right, on the companies that you invest where the companies succeed and the gains you make, seems to me that is... Uh, that is not well thought out because you pay the taxes there and I really cannot get the tax write off completely in the US. Uh, I don't know. I think Mohan should be able to answer that. He deals with this issue. I, I'm not a tax expert yet. Well, well, we'll leave that one for after. We don't want to go on video with tax advice. Did I answer your question? Though? Yes, did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Thank you. Okay, more questions. Yes, please. Since over the last three years, there have not been very many IPOs, 
that means a lot of VC money is tied up in the startups. So the VCs do not have the, all the cash they were expecting to reinvest. So is that true? And secondly, is because in, of the- Is that in India or here? In, in here in the, in the US, no IPOs in the last, you can count the number of IPOs that have been there. Secondly, because of the lack of IPOs, there have been more corporate acquisitions companies acquiring other companies if they see the synergy. So that brings me to a couple of questions. First of all, how is because there is not, they have not freed up their cash, how is going to impacting now and in the future, the reinvestment of their money that the partners and limited partners are tied up. Secondly, the companies that are being acquired, uh, these acquiring companies are giving huge valuations how is the acquisition and merger of these companies impacting the growth of these companies, acquiring companies? Naturally, there is a third thing that's happening. Well, let's, let's maybe just handle these one, one at a time. I can take uh, the last question. Yeah. I, can, I can just give an example of my own company. Yeah, and uh, um, because I see that when these companies get acquired with huge valuation, I do not see the combined results really having the same impact on the company. Okay, again, I'm not trying to answer that question, but I'd like to get your opinion. Yeah. And thirdly, I'm seeing because of the lack of, lack of the yeah, yeah, free yeah, money. We'll, just take one question. Yeah, yeah we'll, just, we'll just do one question from, okay. from each person. So, right. um, so uh, I, I think this uh, making an acquisition successful within a larger organization, that's, a, that's an art by itself. And I think if it is not done properly right from day one, where there is a good chemistry between the acquirer and the acquiree, I think you might just forget it. So it's very, very important to make sure that the core team, including perhaps maybe even the founding team, continues to be actively engaged post acquisition. If that doesn't happen, it's going to be very hard. So I've seen a lot of times acquisition happens then founder is out next day, right? Uh, pretty much the founder is the one who knows the entire chemistry of the organization and the pulse of the organization. And if that person is not there, how do you expect in the event of challenges, right? How do you expect uh, you to have a champion? So I'll give you, uh, when Netscaler got acquired by Citrix, right? The chemistry that was built between us and them was absolutely phenomenal. I mean, first of all, I was very particular that this acquisition is not from a financial gain perspective only. This acquisition, I was more interested to make sure the product that we had built has the ability to reach broader market. And that was put on the table day one. So in fact, I asked this question to the CEO and the CEO had to go back with his team to come and present how he's going to structure the sales and marketing, the go to market aspect of it, to take our product to fit that into their sales machine. And the result today, right, when the acquisition happened, we were about 60, 70 million dollar revenue. Today, Netscaler not only is the backbone of Citrix, but it's almost like a billion plus in revenue. So, having said that, I've also seen lots of other companies actually failing, but I believe this chemistry working out between the two companies right from day one is very important. So, Neil, maybe I'll call you out on this. I first award you a trophy for being a founder who has the longest tenure at an acquirer of anybody I know. Um, uh, and second, say, now that you're in that role, the CTO's organization probably gets deeply involved in integration activities and you have done some deals. So um, uh, do, you, do you feel like, in general, um, with a little bit of hindsight on Adobe's deals, that they tend to be well done and they work, or, or not so much? Yeah, no, I think um, Adobe is, uh, I mean, Adobe has built a lot of its business by acquiring companies, integrating them, and uh, making them work, right? I think they have, as you said, it's a, it's an art. The cultural fit is a very critical piece. The other thing which Adobe has done well is that they give free reign to the acquired companies in terms of running their business, 
and try, and the rest of the Adobe uh, organization actually tries to learn from the acquired company, which is very different. They, Adobe doesn't come in with the mindset that we know best how to do your business, um, and they 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 give a lot of freedom to the acquired company to uh, both figure out how to fit into the Adobe organization as well as the Adobe organization tries to learn from the acquired company, which is uh, which makes a big difference in terms of how people in the acquired company feel, uh, as well as. Uh, uh, figuring out the growth potential for the overall business. Great. Additional questions, yes. Uh, light shirt. Yeah, unlimited funds. Question on the floor is, if you had unlimited capital to invest in India, what sector would you invest in? If you choose a single sector. While you're thinking, I'll give the answer. My answer. <laughs> so, <laughs> I will invest in sports. I'm a huge fan of sports and growing up, I saw India not doing very well in sports. And now they are, so I'd love to invest in sports so we can do better in Olympics in Asia. I would invest in now uh, in India in in uh, entertainment. I think that's a big, big business. Uh, given the nature of the people, I mean, I I won't I won't do consumer, but I think an entertainment like a B two B two C kind of a thing could be very promising. If I have to choose one, I will choose healthcare. I think uh, uh, India is completely underinvested from a healthcare standpoint and is going to go through, see, a dramatic change very, very shortly. Uh, that's where I'll put my money. Yeah, I, I think the big thing India needs right now is infrastructure. And uh, if there was an easy way to build a startup in the infrastructure space, I guess that would be the place where you would invest. But uh, uh, I guess it's a government thing more than a startup thing. Okay, purple shirt. It's my impression that uh, acquisitions generally result in uh, a diminishment of jobs. I'm wondering, can you tell us what percentage of uh, m and result in job growth? It's for you. You, you, you. you're the research guy. Yeah. Well, so acquisitions are a complicated, complicated, complicated subject. <laughs> um, there are many kinds of deals. Um, the typical large company deal is driven by boards of public companies to approve large company deals, typically look for cost savings, and one form of cost savings are employment cuts. So if you look at the history of large companies merging with large companies, there tends to be a net employment reduction over some time horizon. In mature uh, industries. In, in when mature large companies. Um, when high growth tech companies right. acquire early stage venture back companies, generally speaking, there's no cost synergy play in the strategic logic for those deals. And there's a plan to allocate some of the corporate balance sheet to invest in the, the, the business, the sector areas in which acquisitions are done. Um, and there's a hope to retain and build on acquired teams. So there's not, there's not a general answer, I don't think, on the record of, of, of M&A, um, but there is a sort of sector by sector distinction and the kinds of deals that these folks have been involved in, as you've heard, BV story, um, and um, I, I think Ajit stories and, and Anil stories, these companies have, when they're acquired, they generally receive investment capital and experience employment growth. Yeah, no, I agree. Maybe in mature industries, it's more about cutting jobs, but uh, at least uh, in in technology and growth areas, um, like Adobe never cuts people when they hire or when they acquire a company. It's more about how to grow the business and create more jobs as a result of growth rather than uh, cost synergy that, that the acquisitions are made. So I think 
the key thing is that with the acquiring company, when it acquires for growth, you'll see that they have a plan in terms of how to drive synergies so that the whole business grows rather than you cut people and just take the cost part of it, cost part of the equation out. So you're always trying to grow the top line rather than uh, improve the bottom line by cutting costs. So maybe one final question if there is one. Yes, the green shirt, please. Thank you. Hi, I'm wondering about what we can do to promote the ecosystem so India can produce more unicorns. They can produce more? More unicorns. More unicorns. So what, what's one institutional change? I think by ecosystem you mean the institutional environment or, or something of that nature? Thanks for asking. So, so Venk mentioned Startup Bridge India, which BV and Venk were part of putting together initially and supporting. And we're here to catalyze, uh, catalyze 100 billion in partnerships between Indian enterprises and global corporations because one of the issues they have when coming to the United States and trying to ex scale their market is customer acquisition and partnerships. And I'm wondering, I'm hearing a lot of other organizations and other types of activities to try to promote the development of an ecosystem to, to promote the ability, to create the ability for more Indian uh, unicorns. Yeah. Um, let me first take a cut and maybe you should expand on that, given the fact that we did this billion dollar baby. And we, and um, we are down to three minutes. Um, my, I mean, I've been involved with a, a bunch of these unicorn companies, and if I see a pattern, if I see a pattern, basically it comes down to a few things. Number one is telling the story in the most simplistic manner, meaning if an entrepreneur tells a story, I should be able to get that story in less than 30 seconds. And the market... I. Not him, the, not the entrepreneur, but me as an investor, venture capitalist, I should be able to actually visualize how big that market is, right? And then comes the execution aspect of it. I, I think these are the three put together in some combination, typically results in these unicorns. And when I say unicorn, it's not a billion dollar value, it is more billion dollar revenues. Right, So you have to actually see, is the market big enough to eventually produce a billion dollar in revenue? Now, having said that, enterprise companies, like I'm going to repeat this again, enterprise companies, I don't see in India, for the Indian market, to create these unicorns. But I think consumer companies in India can definitely create multiple billion dollars, as you heard since morning, right, with the 900 million cell phones proliferation all over India and this whole digitization, you know, all of that that is happening, uh, I, I think there's plenty of opportunities to bring uh, valuable content to the end users and, and monetize that, right? And we have already seen Flipkart and then this Swiggy is another company which is kind of like a DoorDash in India, and that's a billion dollar plus valuation in India as well. So I think if we can extrapolate from that, consumer centric companies in India, you have the potential. But enterprise companies, if we tap into, you know, these three things that I said, uh, have the initial validation in India and then bring them into Silicon Valley and turn them into unicorn sort of companies. I, th I think that actually is time, Solomon. Yes, thank you very much. The panel, just stay here. For